So this session is a, is a discussion of why measuring social progress matters. Um, and we're going to receive some uh, more definitive answers uh, a bit later um, uh, from uh, Amitabh Kant when he gives his keynote speech about measuring progress and Professor Porter uh, when he talks about the Social Progress Index. I just want to um, say a few words of introduction about the Social Progress Index because some of you, uh, Professor Porter mentioned it briefly this morning, but it's worth giving you a little bit more of an introduction and telling you a bit more about what we're doing. So the Social Progress Index uh, has been created specifically not as a replacement for GDP and economic measures, but as a complement. The Social Progress Index uh, measures countries and societies based entirely on a range of social and environmental outcome indicators. And this allows us to then look at social progress independently of economic variables. This, th what this tells us is a number of things about the relationship between economic development and social progress the professor will talk about a little bit later. But what the, we can get from the Social Progress Index is a real insight into the real lived experience of people living in a country across a range of dimensions from the basic human needs like uh, food and safety through to more advanced things like freedom of choice and rights, etc. Um, the Social Progress Index has been running now uh, since 2013, producing an annual global index. Uh, the global 2017 index will come out next month, covering 128 countries. I'm not going to tell you, give you a sneak preview of India's results. You'll have to wait till then. But we're here today because of a very exciting development, which is that we're releasing today the beta version of a social progress index for the states of India. Uh, this has been a project of uh, the Institute for Competitiveness in association with Niti Aayog. And we're really excited about this because what we found around the world is that when you can create a social progress index at a more granular level, it provides real insights, real actionable insights for government, business and civil society. So today, uh, um, IFC are releasing this report, uh, this, this, re this report on this beta version of the index about 27 states of India. And then the further work is planned to look at 50 cities and more than 500 districts of India. It's a very exciting project and Amit, I'm sure, would be delighted to tell you more about that uh, later on. I wanted to just show you very quickly to introduce this discussion one slide, if I may. You saw this, mor this morning from Professor Porter. And what this shows is some the results from this, this uh, state-level index for India. And what we've done in creating this data set is started in 2005 and created a consistent data set running through to 2016. And I think there's a very important message here, which is that over the last 10 years, we have seen significant gains in social progress across all the states of India. And I don't know, the world sometimes seems to have so many problems, it's easy to be pessimistic. It's important to realize where we actually do see progress. What we see is that the levels of progress are not even. It's not always the best performing states that are improving fastest. You will have much more thought and insight about this than I will. But this is a, a chance to have a look at this data showing how there is improvement. And I think really moving the discussion on and thinking about how to accelerate progress, how to address the next set of challenges related to sustainable development goals. So if we look at social progress 2016 to 2030, perhaps we'll see the bars moving much faster to the right if we can get things, things right. I'm going to um, uh, start the panel by asking uh, Nitya to perhaps provide some comments. Nitya, you've had a chance to have a, a short look at some of this data. Um, you're a scholar who's worked on sustainable development in a range of ways. What's your thought looking at the Social Progress Index data for India? Well, Michael, thank you for that very excellent introduction on the SPI. And I know we're going to hear further from Professor Porter later this afternoon. But I just wanted to make the case for uh, the Sustainable Development Goals in India and connected to the Social Progress Index. And I think that, uh, you know, in, uh, on several occasions, in India's case, Prime Minister Modi has said that India's development agenda closely reflects that of the SDGs. And there's been a sense of proactive ownership of the SDGs as evidenced in the 15-year action plans of the state and the center. So there's definitely been a, a greater reception to the SDGs compared to the MDGs. And I think one of the reasons has been that there's been a wider consultative process around the SDGs. Many more actors were involved, not only nation states, but also civil society, businesses, philanthropies, philanthropists, uh, the NGO world. Everybody came together to synthesize these 17 goals. So th there's a sense of buy-in of, of these goals, and that, that's la much larger than just nation states. 
uh, the SDGs are also much more intentional and they're couched in the language of deepening democracy. So the remit is much larger than just nation states. Um, and clearly a case can be made for the private sector, civil society and um, nation states to be involved in order to move the needle on the SDGs. But in India's case, historically, as in Latin America and several other uh, countries, there's been a slight suspicion between business on the one hand and government on the other. And this is where I think that the social progress index can make a huge difference. Because the SPI can really be, a, it can form a blueprint or a roadmap, a common language around which these various actors can come together in order to direct investment more sustainably. Because the SPI truthfully is, I think, the most comprehensive index we have so far on social progress. Um, and I think that, um, you know, the, in order to accelerate progress and to benchmark success, you need an index that's able to measure. And the SPI will help us on that road to achieve the SDGs because measurement is a key first step to achieving the SDGs. And finally, I just wanted to say that um, I think if we get the India story right, if we get India on the path to achieve the SDG, 1.3 billion Indians achieving the SDGs, then the world is on track to achieve the SDGs. And finally, just looking at your data very quickly, I wanted to say that every district in India has a healthy development budget of about $100 million a year. So the resource envelope is there and the policy framework is there, but clearly something's missing. And I think measuring, by measuring in these, very cleverly as you do in three buckets, the various indicators and components, it'll help us narrow down what we need to change to, to, to achieve the progress we need to for the SDGs. Thanks, Nitya. Maybe I can jump to you to a scene to, to get the sort of a business perspective. Um, as Nitya was saying, there's sometimes some hostility between government and business, and some people in business might say that social progress, the SDGs, isn't our business. What do you think? So, I mean, we are excited about uh, uh, this whole social progress bit. We are not, uh, uh, there is no, there is no uh, uh, animosity or any, anything like that. Uh, very clearly, we are excited because uh, when economic progress leads to social progress, you go through a sequential uh, a step up from your basic needs to, to a better quality of life, and then you move to a little more aspirational stage. Uh, and I think it's all very sequential because basic needs never remain the same. Look at our basic needs in the 80s versus basic needs we have today. And they moved on. And that uh, cycle actually gives, uh, gives uh, or rather generates a new business opportunity every time. Uh, the 80s business model versus the 2010 business model in terms of addressing basic needs. Look at the auto industry, look at the uh, cell phone industry. It's all sort of, uh, uh, it's changed. The, the, the bar has changed. And uh, India is a good story in that direction because uh, there are economies in the world uh, where this cycle is not so linked, uh, where economic uh, progress uh, doesn't necessarily lead to social progress. Uh, you have uh, economies in the world rich in minerals, rich in oil, uh, but they use the funds differently. And economies that have used them back for the society have thrived versus the other economies. So, uh, it's good to be in India. It's a good uh, time when uh, we can see this link very clearly established. Every dollar earned today uh, makes a person step up in life, uh, tries to sort of uh, uh, make more demands from the whole uh, economic space, and that's where more businessmen jump in. And I think it's a positive cycle, and uh, uh, the way it appears, and the stage where we are, it can just carry on like this for three decades. And therefore, huge opportunity for uh, people like us who've just sort of uh, entered into new businesses. Yeah. Thanks, Yasim. Now, now Hisham, you're working with the Children's Investment Fund Foundation, investing heavily in children, which is clearly about social progress. But you also think that's also about economic development as well. There's a, there's a spillover effect. Tell us a bit more about that. Absolutely. And uh, maybe I'd go back to something that Dr. Porter said in the morning. And I'm paraphrasing, but, but in essence, he said that you don't get economic progress because of low wages. The whole purpose of, of economic progress is to raise wages. Uh, and, and, and so therefore, the way we look at uh, social progress is it's actually building the foundations for the economy going forward. And let me illustrate. If you take something like a nutrition program or a deworming program, they seem like nice, cute, fluffy development projects. Uh, but actually, today's children 
if they have the right levels of nutrition, will be physically stronger, therefore they'll be mentally brighter, therefore they'll be cognitively better in school, they will do better in school, they will get better jobs, and they'll be more economically productive. You know, for us, the, the connection between that measly worm today that's stealing uh, nutrition from, uh, from a child's stomach and GDP growth 20 years hence is clear. Uh, I, I make this point because if we, build, if we raise average product, uh, you know, productivity and wages up, what you're building is you're building not just uh, a, a, a more equal society, but you're building the consumer classes for tomorrow. Uh, and and that, that needs to be that constant endeavor. We just need to take a 20-year horizon rather than a three-year, uh, you know, planning cycle. Uh, I'd like to make one other point, which is that, uh, you know, you talk a lot about, I mean, not, people talk about the trickle-up theory. If we don't get it right, what you might have is a pull-down theory. If you have an entire generation that is economically underproductive, where wages are low, you're not going to have this massive middle-class engine being able to lift us up as a nation. And, and so we should constantly look at how do we build uh, uh, the base up to not trickle up from the top, but push us up from the bottom. It's a great point. Now, sometimes sort of social investments can be seen as costs rather than investments. But let's go to the um, sustainable development goals, the environment. I mean, often the environment is seen as perhaps being a trade-off with development. Richie, how are you with the Environmental Defence Fund? How do you see that being managed in India over the next 15 years so we get development that's also sustainable? Thank you, and uh, thank you to Institute for Competitiveness to actually put the, uh, for putting the SPI together. So, uh, first of all, I'd say that it's great to have empirical data on social progress. Because what it allows us to do is actually to think about, so go back to Michael's talk earlier this morning. He was talking about your endowments, your macroeconomic indicators, the policy pieces, and the microeconomy. But it allows us to rethink how to put all that together to meet that end game. Because that's the eight ball that you have to have in mind. That's your objective. So from that angle, that's where we come from. Uh, we are sort of focused on uh, the role of the environment and inclusivity and development. And uh, let me illustrate with an example here. Uh, minister was here earlier talking about energy. So if you think about energy, it's not just about producing electrons. So if you have a development problem, so energy is a precursor or a precondition to deal with development, right? So can we think about producing, so in rural India, if you think about, we have challenges on water, on sanitation, uh, there's needs for refrigeration, all those pieces that need to come together to promote inclusive growth, right? A sense of shared prosperity. So question is then, instead of trying to think about generating electron alone, can we think about generating the electron in a way that also meets very efficiently the needs? For, for example, we are building a mini grid. Uh, it's a concentrated solar thermal mini grid. So what it does is we're producing electrons, but we're also going to take the waste steam and turn it into drinking water, 60,000 liters of drinking water for a panchayat. And we take the waste heat and convert it into uh, refrigeration for refrigerated storage. We take the peri-urban waste from Bangalore and try and convert it into energy. So those are the kind of things that allows us to sort of imagine a different future. So SPI really helps when we think about policy landscapes and how we're going to put our Lego blocks, the building blocks. So India is a bit of a blank slate on this, and it's really exciting. So having that SPI in place can really help us imagine where we want to go. Great. Thank you. Now, Amrit, you do a lot of work with government. And Nitchi was saying how you know, there's the resources there in budgets. It's how do we get that money being used to really advance social progress. What's going to be the challenge for government in this agenda to 2030? Well, I think, I think uh, you know, if I for a moment look at a number of other indices which are used by government for something or the other, and then look at social progress uh, index, uh, it's a good thing that we have this in place and over a period of time. Uh, <coughs> Having said that, government should be very clear in their mind that A, how do we progress further rather than just look at do I compete better with a neighboring state or a neighboring district, right? We have seen, for example, in the ease of doing business index, the whole game seems to be how do I beat another state and 
come out better in ranking rather than how do I progress with reference to what I was a year ago or two years ago. And I think in social progress, that will be one of the challenges to make sure that everybody in the government from the top to the operating level functionary is looking for the objective as improving my own social progress index rather than a competition. The second challenge that I see is that we must look at these index and numbers from their backward and forward linkages. How, how is the data actually collected and utilized for coming up with this index? As uh, Professor Porter mentioned earlier in the day, I think one of the issues that we have is the quality of data that actually gets captured at the ground level. So when somebody says access to drinking water has changed from 5,000 villages to 5,500 villages, it is important to go and look at the quality of that collection of data and improve that using the help of partnership with a number of NGOs. You should not be leaving it to the government functionary, otherwise you may get distorted indexes coming out because the quality of data is not all that good in many, many areas. The forward linkages, once you have that number and once you know that you want to improve your index, it should not stop there. That's not the end goal. The end goal is what do I do to improve the index and what do I do with reference to which set of population? Because this is an index at a certain level, maybe at a state level or a district level. I would even feel that at an appropriate point in time, maybe a few years down the line when there is enough maturity to look at actions connected to SPI, we should really be able to bring it down to an individual level and say, like a credit score of an individual, what is the SPI score for an individual? Can we improve that? Can we use that to give income support? So all the people whose SPI is below X are eligible for income support. So everybody then starts giving it the maximum importance because it is no more a question about league tables, publishing social progress index, but it is about integrating it with whole lot of programs. So there is a nutrition program, it goes to those whose SPI is low. There is a water program, there is a food program, whatever it is. So the forward and backward linkages, as I call it, is the biggest challenge. It should not become, let me get an index number which looks good and let me use that to market my state. It should not stop at that. It should go well beyond that. I love that. And the social progress imperative we talk about from index to action to impact. The ranking is just the beginning of the story. So much more follows. Nishi, you wanted to come in. Um, I just wanted to uh, echo your comments, which, uh, which you made some excellent points. And I also wanted to say the great thing about the SPI is it captures output indicators rather than input. So it's the quality of life and longevity rather than how much a government spends on health, which is a very important difference. Uh, and uh, secondly, again, going back to the data, I think it would be interesting to, to transpose the SPI data we have for the Indian states with GDP, because the anomalies in the correlation between GDP and the SPI would also give you interesting results. Like globally, we have uh, Costa Rica, which is a, a, a superpower in terms of SPI, compared to you know, countries with similar GDP like South Africa. Uh, Costa Rica outperforms by a factor of a you know, huge amount. Uh, so, GDP is not everything, and to uh, prioritize social progress and look at it side by side to GDP is interesting. Again, the United States, uh, I think, you know, it's the highest per capita health spend in the U.S., but again, it's number 11 in the world in terms of uh, health and well-being. So, what does it mean for governments to interpret this data? How can we isolate uh, the key factors that can accelerate progress and benchmark success? And I think the SPI can help us do this. Yeah, we certainly find this, you know, what our data shows is that countries are not prisoners of their GDP, that there's a whole range of choices that really matter about social progress beyond just getting GDP. He should wanted to come in. Yeah, I want to just take forward the discussion on GDP, but I had a slightly terrifying thought just now, which is that it's already got its own acronym, does the Social Progress Index, and it hasn't even been released. Normally, <laughs> we take like years to build out the acronym. Uh, so, every major 
economic indicator that we have is a lagging indicator, GDP, per capita incomes, you know, trade deficit, etc. I look at the social product progress indicator as a, a leading indicator of what's likely to happen. So if you take forward the example of Costa Rica, this is likely to tell you what's going to happen five or ten years down the line. To be honest, the, the only two uh, leading indicators we have right now on, on the economy are, are the size of natural resources that we have and, and the population uh, age band. Those are the only two really uh, leading ones. The word of caution on the social progress index that I'd, I'd give is, um, it is essential that you have far more regular updates of that information. Just to give you an illustration, um, you know, any major uh, social index typically gets picked up every five years. So whether it's, you know, the number of child laborers that we have, uh, or, or, or maternal mortality or infant mortality, etc. Imagine if you were the finance minister and you were running the economy based on five-year-old GDP data. It just wouldn't happen. So that's going to be the biggest challenge of how do we get regular updated data. Yeah, that's a great point. I think there's two things. One is the granularity and then is the speed of updates. And I know one of the countries we're working with already, Paraguay has integrated social progress into its national plan. And the Minister of Planning is now working on quarterly social progress data because you need that kind of speed and regularity. And look, we're, we're under time pressure. I've had a note that we're going to have to finish fairly soon. So what I would like to do is give each of you a chance to give you know, one thought, one priority if we think about India's social progress, progress towards the SDGs over the next 15 years. What's the priority? Now, Asim, you've taken the microphone, so I've, you've kind of been lumbered. No, I've I taken the microphone for a different uh, point because Amrit <laughs> was making a point about the quality of uh, data. Uh, and I think it's also about the relevance of the data. I think the way we've uh, learned over time that the global uh, ways of measuring uh, indices and parameters and stuff are not really uh, applicable across the world. And the way we've learned that even business models cannot be just cut pasted and brought to India and said, okay, this is it. Uh, I think somewhere the same is also has to be a little corrected. Because I was looking at the prosperity index this uh, morning. I think Professor Porter was putting it up there. And uh, uh, I must confess, I had a sort of uh, uh, immediate reaction. I was trying to compare it with uh, my country with other countries. And I wanted to see where is China and where is Pakistan uh, compared to you know, you know, India. And uh, I think it's, uh, it doesn't have to be that relative. It's a state of mind. And uh, 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 Prosperity is a state of mind, and uh, Indians behave very differently. From even Bengal to Bombay, uh, the prosperity state of mind index is going to be very different. And where a, where a citizen draws a line and says, I'm done, uh, needs to also be understood. Because we can all be pushing, but uh, he may not be needing it. So that's another uh, tangential view on this. Yeah, uh, Bombay to Bengal, we can't adapt for that, but I think one of the really strong points about this index is the way it's been developed not by the Social Progress Imperative for Washington, D.C., but by the Institute for Competitiveness India in partnership with TIO. So it's got real local insight and knowledge behind it, and that's really, really critical. Richie, did you want to come in? Yeah, I was just actually thinking about, you know, you've got the SBI, and it's great to have a bunch of indicators. And then we think about policy reform or implementing a particular program or investing to help improve that SPI, I think it's really important to also have those, have the ability to actually measure the impacts as we test out some of these policies and really understand what's the most efficient and effective ways to get that done. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Harry. At that point, I've just been cut off. Um, <laughs> panel, I wish we could have carried on longer. This is, we were just warming up. But um, thank you so much, and uh, we hope we can continue.